In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last Sunday, Jesus was with respectable people, the rich, religious, and honorable people. It was a fine house and a sumptuous supper. When Jesus was invited, he went. He did not despise or scorn those people because they were rich. Jesus did not come just for the sake of the poor or just for the sake of the rich. How much money a person had was not the important thing. He had come for all, not for all vaguely and in general, but because every single man, woman, and child needed him. The people Jesus had supper with last Sunday did not feel they needed him because they felt quite sure of themselves. They lived decent lives. They were the prominent ones in church. They were the leaders among God's chosen people. They had the scriptures, the law, and the promises of God. They were the seed of Abraham on whom God must surely look with satisfaction. And then when Jesus came their way, they were interested in what he had to say, of course. People were talking about this man from Nazareth, so they wanted to look him over to confirm their views and prejudices and really ultimately opinion of themselves. Jesus would be useful for their purposes or they would have to tear him down and set him straight according to their way of thinking. But whether he came or not, whether he made interesting conversation or was merely an opinionated and boring son of a Nazarene carpenter, didn't really concern them and certainly didn't and wouldn't make any difference to them. That there might be a need for a change in themselves. That they might need to be deeply influenced by him. That was far from their thinking. And that Jesus would be their Lord that they didn't even consider. To these people, Jesus spoke some hard words. You heard those last week. Jesus does not allow himself to be considered in a detached or condescending way. Jesus forces us to come face up to God. And when we confront Christ, we must say either yes or no to God, either amen or leave, because God cannot be taken in little doses. The whole pill must be swallowed. Jesus' host last Sunday felt they did not need God and acted if they had God already in their back pockets. So when God came to them in Christ and called them to himself, they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. Other things were more important to them. They wanted to keep their lives and their interests intact. They were well satisfied with themselves and their really petty little lives. They felt no need for him. Therefore, from Jesus, they received nothing, nothing but rejection. Of his supper to those who were invited, they did not taste. Then today, Jesus again is a guest, but this time with a different sort of people. These are the riffraff, the poor and the despised, the sort of people you didn't want to be associated with if you valued what people might say about you. Their lives hadn't turned out so well. They had failed of respectability and success and had instead given themselves to all manners of loose living to fill up those hollow, sinful lives. When Jesus visited them, he didn't have to tell them that they had gone astray or had wandered far from God. They knew it quite well. Their trouble was that they doubted whether God would have any use for them. They saw their need. They looked to Jesus with hope. So when Jesus received them and went to have supper with them in their home, the respectable people complained. How can this man be a man of God if he associates with that sort of people? They were anxious about the cause of God, but not Jesus. Instead, their sort of God. They were unhallowing God's holy name 
for a man who claimed to speak for God to be mixed up with some disrespectable people. God's business, of course, is with good people, the decent and respectable, people like themselves. But how completely they misunderstood God's business. And Jesus then shows them with the three parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, and finally the lost son. God's business is bringing and keeping lost sheep close to himself so that they may be forgiven and have the joy that God wants them to have in that forgiveness. They don't come to Jesus. Jesus comes to them. And to give all of that to us. When some said they didn't need him, Jesus turned and said to others who knew their need. It was not that he approved of their sin by eating with them, but rather acknowledged that they needed him so badly. Last Sunday then, it was the poor, the lame, and the blind that ultimately, Jesus said, would receive the fellowship and food of Christ. Today, it is the lost lamb. Now, as you know, or maybe you don't, but a sheep, as you've heard probably many times at least, is the most helpful, helpless and foolish of animals. The old German is helpful here. They were cough, mutton heads. Sheep need constant care, watching, and protection. By themselves, they are easy prey. All is well with them only when they stay close together and within the shepherd's care. They can't go it alone. So when Jesus calls us sheep, he's saying some basic things about us. We should cling together close to the shepherd. We should cling together congregation close to the shepherd, Jesus. But the big point of today's parable is about the sheep that goes wrong and gets lost. If you've ever heard the bleeding of a lamb that's separated from the ewe or from the flock and is lost, you will know how pitiful that lamb's plight is. Its peril and need are great, and to this need, a good shepherd makes a ready response. On the other hand, a hireling will, of course, not worry too much, for what is a single sheep out there amongst so many here? A hireling thinks only of the less or more of his own advantage. Better to keep the 99 safe than to go after the one that is lost. But the shepherd to whom the sheep belong has quite a different idea. He does not think numerically or mathematically, but instead thinks of each sheep individually. When one sheep goes astray and is in danger, he goes after it, leaving the 99, going after the lost one until he finds it. This does not mean that there's more or less of Jesus' love for any particular sheep. He does not love the 99 less because he leaves them together and searches for the lost one. He would do the same for each one of them. Consider this example. A good mother loves all her children, of course. But when one of them is sick, she gives all her attention to that child, worries and cares for the sick child so it will soon be better again. Does that mean that she's ceased to love her other children, that she's neglecting them when the one needs that special care, is sick, needs love? As it is with the good mother, so it is with the good shepherd. Special needs call for special care, each receiving according to their need. And remember, the 99 are relatively safe and secure. There's strength in numbers. There's strength in a Christian congregation. Many of us have been a part of this flock since our infancy, made sheep of Jesus by our baptism. Within this community of, of God's people, where, is, where there is safety and security and welfare, you can't be a member of a flock alone, in isolation. A sheep that is separated from a flock is a lost sheep. I think all of us know what this is like. Sometimes we have gone our own way and deserted the flock of God and our shepherd Jesus. And the truth is that lost to ourselves, we would perish, drugged and poisoned by the noxious needs, weeds of this world, 
prey to the lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour and torn by the sharp tear, teeth of fear and uncertainty. But the good shepherd will not let you perish. He comes after you patiently and lovingly and carries you back on his shoulders to the flock, as you see every week in the stained glass window. On our wounds and our injuries, Jesus pours the balm of forgiveness. And for our hunger, he gives us the food of his word and the fellowship of this, his flock, his family. If we are in the flock today, we must confess that Jesus is the reason that he came after us and carried us back here again. And when we stray, we know that it is we who stray. It's our fault. And when we are brought back, we know that it is he who brought us back, as Jesus clearly teaches. I did not, you did not choose me, but I chose you, he says. We can call ourselves his own flock today and hereafter solely by his mercy. He is the one that we put our reliance and our certainty in, not in ourselves, not in even our respectability and our prominence, our importance, what we've done for the church or for the world, our decent lives or anything of us. It is only in the unfailing mercy of Jesus, our good shepherd, who is so patient and good that we can claim anything. To be in the flock means to be guided by the shepherd, to follow his bidding and example. And that also means sharing his concern for the other sheep, especially the lost ones. We may not, like the Pharisees, ignore the lost sheep and write them off as not good enough, not fit to be associated with us or with Christ. Nor may we, like the prodigal's older brother, resent the special effort the father took for the lost son and claim that if anybody is to be bothered, it must be him. We know ourselves to have been often lost sheep. And Jesus found us. We know what it means to be a lost sheep that is found and to be brought back into the flock on the shoulders of our good shepherd. We want other lost sheep to know that too. The love, care, and concern that Jesus has for us is for them too. And we don't have to look too far for lost sheep. Many of them are even on our roles as members. Within the circle of our own family and friends, we will find them. And near us, many are wandering, lost from the shepherd and from this, his flock. When we go after the lost sheep and seek them out, we show Jesus what it means to us that he sought us out and brought us back into the fold. And in doing this, we are promised something extraordinary in the gospel today, a share in the angel's joy, angels rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, one lost lamb returned to Christ's flock. This joy is God's goal for us. And this joy is never in isolation, separate from Christ and his flock, we are saddened. The joy is lost to us. But the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. And it is his joy to knit us back together. And then to share the angel's joy over lost people brought again to life in Christ. Their baptism holding true. And so it is your shepherd's never-ending work to restore you repeatedly by his word, by absolution, by your baptism and by the supper. And so today Jesus has restored you to his flock and he sets a table before you. Whether you are rich, religious, honorable people or the riffraff, the poor, and the despised. All come, eat and drink and be restored again. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.